Dr. Feelgood have been the backbone of British R&B for 10 years. They emerged in the early 70s, playing their then unfashionable brand of music at a time when rock was preoccupied with glitter and extravagance. same town, Canby Island in Essex. Sparko, the bass player and myself, were interested in starting a band which played old rhythm and blues stuff, Muddy Waters, John Muirka, Chuck Berry, all that kind of stuff. That was the, the music we were interested in playing. Ninety percent of it was old material, and it wasn't even all strict R&B. We used to put in sort of old rock and roll songs as well for good measure. Because we were playing in pubs and we wanted to wanted to please our audience, you know, to, to attract their attention for at least half the time, we'd play sort of old Buddy Holly songs. We were taken notice of because of the, our weird appearance, our very ordinary appearance. You know, we weren't sort of dressing up in any particular clothes or anything. We were just finishing work and getting up to London quick and playing the gigs. I think that's maybe why people started to take notice of us because of our strange appearance and a very unfashionable type of music. <laughs> I'm not a technical musician or a technical singer in any respect. I just, I think that if you feel the song, it doesn't matter if you're not even particularly a good singer, you just uh, do it and almost as a matter of theatre, you put it across to an audience. My actual singing style, um, I, I must admit that I've ripped most of it off from Howling Wolf. I saw Howling Wolf when I was about 16, and uh, that was one of the finest performances I've ever seen in my life. There was this man, like 60 years old, with grizzled grey hair, uh, a real tatty 1940s mohair suit. And I thought he looked the business myself, you know, and he, he was the king. Right? He came out on stage, and there was an old man, and he got up and he just rocked, and a big fella, and he moved about, and he had a harmonica, he had a, he had a Hona harmonica in that end, and a Shaw microphone and you couldn't see it, he was just a big fella. He was like a bear more than a wolf. And I saw that man deliver a, a great show, a blinding show, unequaled. And um, from that day until this one, I've always kind of thought, well, if you can perform like Alan Wolf, then you're doing a good job. Songs and they're not really protest songs. I mean, they're just, uh, I think the word lament is better, maybe, than protest. They were about basic things about, you know, love, money, lack of it, and boozing and whatever. You know, they, they were very down to earth. I mean, if I was going to sing it convincingly, um, I had to sort of be in accord with these sentiments. You know? If white people feel comfortable about singing it, let them sing it. I mean, you might as well say that white people can't sing reggae. What 
we're singing about is bad luck, I suppose, a lot of the time. You know, sods are on bad luck, but at the same time, I think that most blues singers have got their tongue very firmly placed in their cheek. They're almost saying, well, all right, you know, this is a lousy deal, but it'll be all right in the end of the day, and let's have a good time anyway, and let's get drunk and forget all about it, you know? And I think that that's the, uh, the attitude that even people like Muddy Waters and what have you used to sing in Chicago and what have you, and that's certainly the way it's become with the English style of R&B. I mean, we're not supposed to get people crying in their beer, you know, we're supposed to get them enjoying themselves having a good time. I think that uh, when I, I said earlier about the blues being a lament, a lament rather than a protest, is just that I, I just don't like the idea of it being a protest song. It's not a protest, you're not protesting against anything, it's nothing political or anything like that. You know, you're just, uh, you're just drowning your sorrows about your own bad luck, you know, and hoping for some better times. When the black man was playing blues, uh, rock rhythms were going along with it, but they were always six, eight time. They weren't four, four time like modern rock, rock, rock records. A blues six, eight is... Um, which is, um, it's, it's a slow rock rhythm. Modern rock, as you know, is much more up front. And, uh, when the white man picked up on these black rhythms, I call them black rhythms, and he changed it to a 4-4 four, four format, which I, like I just played, um, the kids started dancing to it. All of a sudden they found they could dance to this music. And you, you would ask any kid at that time, he said, what do you like about this music? Oh, it's the beat, it's the beat. It's a um, bang, um, bang. They could dance to it very easily. And that gave it a much more universal appeal. Love Hound contains many of the basic elements of R&B. Simple chords, simple story, and a driving rhythm, all based on the 12-bar blues. Normally when we play it live, it comes from a segue number. We come straight out of one song. Um, and then the big figure on the drums just smashes his way into four, and, you know, four bass drum beats. Crack, crack, crack. Then on top of that, in comes the bass. The guitar comes in. What you basically got is a, is a whole chunk of solid rhythm. I think in the English sense of the word R&B, it's different to the American terminology, I mean.